Hello, everybody. My name is Ben Gramling. I'm uh, calling in, dialing in from the south side of Milwaukee here in Wisconsin. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with everybody and to talk about our experience in uh, first developing the green infrastructure scenarios tool uh, focused on uh, one key watershed here in the Milwaukee metropolitan area and, uh, and then also to talk about how we piloted the use of that scenarios tool with uh, a stakeholder group here in Milwaukee. Uh, I, I'm going to start out with a couple of slides just to set the stage in terms of the place. Uh, here in Milwaukee, and then uh, I'll turn it over to Beth, and then I'll come back at the back end as well. Um, I am the Director of Environmental Health at the 16th Street Community Health Centers. We're a federally qualified community health center, and a number of folks participating in the webinar may have some understanding about what FQHCs uh, do in communities across the country. We're one of about 1,100 nationwide and one of about 18 federally qualified community health centers in the state of Wisconsin. Um, I, I'm really here participating in the webinar representing the local effort, and you'll hear more about the partners uh, as we go further into our presentation, um, but, but know that, um, that I, I'm just representing a, a number of key organizations that have been plying away at the uh, opportunity that's represented by green infrastructure here in the metro area. Um, I won't go through all the facts that are up on the slide right now regarding 16th Street. I think we, we look uh, a lot like many FQHCs. We're, we're probably larger than the average community health center across the country, but uh, for an, uh, a, a CHC serving an urban population as we are here in Milwaukee, our client demographics look pretty common uh, to other CHCs across the country. Um, what is a bit unique for our health center here at 16th Street, though, is that we've had for the last 20 years or so a Department of Environmental Health. And on the next slide, we have the vision statement for our Department of Environmental Health, which I operate here at 16th Street. And uh, for us, the department created 20 years ago really came out of the realization um, that you know, really isn't rocket science, that uh, in order for people to become healthy or to stay healthy, they need to be spending much of their time in environments that are healthy themselves, whether it's an urban environment uh, like here in Milwaukee or a rural environment, whether it's a built environment or a natural environment, you need to have that uh, healthy foundation in order to stay healthy uh, going forward. So over the years, we've dealt with uh, developed programming that deals with issues like the presence of environmental lead and the challenges associated with childhood lead poisoning, uh, lead poisoning among our population. We've been involved in uh, both small and very large scale brownfields redevelopment projects here in the Milwaukee area. We've worked on ambient air quality concerns as they relate to asthma and other respiratory uh, disease issues here in Milwaukee. Um, but in looking at our uh, neighborhoods that we serve, uh, if you look at the next slide, there's a, a graphic that I think does, does an okay job of showing the south side of Milwaukee that we serve. Um, the many dots that you see, yellow and red dots, represent households that are directly served by 16th Street. Um, there are uh, approximately 23,000 households in that immediate vicinity that are home to clients of ours. And um, it might be a little hard to pick out, particularly on the southern edge of our service delivery area, but what's key for the neighborhoods that we serve is that they're bordered on three sides by water. Uh, Milwaukee as a whole um, was founded on the shores of three major river systems, the Milwaukee River, the Menominee River, and the Kinnikinnick River, all of which come together to form the harbor, which then empties out into Lake Michigan. And with our neighborhood tucked between the uh, lower reaches of the Menominee and Kinnikinnick Rivers and with Lake Michigan on the eastern edge, the health and vitality of our water resources have a lot to do with the uh, conditions of the urban environments where our families live. And for us over the years, we've developed um, programming that really understands that issue and has worked to understand the challenges that exist and to bring together solutions that can help improve our water resources here in the Milwaukee metropolitan area. Um, we haven't done that just on our own. Um, if you look uh, to the next slide, 
which shows a much larger portion of the metro area. This graphic shows the um, Greater Milwaukee watershed, uh, for the most part capturing the uh, Greater Milwaukee River Basin and other watershed systems that ultimately flow either through downtown Milwaukee out into Lake Michigan or in the case of the southern edge of the area here shown flows through the community of Racine, which is a city just to the south of us before uh, discharging out into Lake Michigan. And um, we have worked with a number of partners, uh, including uh, 1,000 Friends of Wisconsin, the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District, uh, the Southeastern Wisconsin Watersheds Trust, the state's Department of Natural Resources to help bring about an awareness and momentum to drive watershed restoration in a number of key watersheds across the metro area. And for 16th Street, because of where we're located in the metro area, our core priority watershed is the Kinnikinnick River watershed, or uh, the KK as it's known here locally, which is the green watershed shown kind of right in the middle of the, the graphic here on display. And uh, I'll note that while we go Further into the presentation, we're going to key in on the green infrastructure scenarios tool as it was de developed for the KK. Um, some folks on the webinar uh, may know, and, and for others, you should know that green infrastructure is a very hot topic across the entire region, um, driven by the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District and the Southeastern Wisconsin Watersheds Trust and a number of other leaders in the region who understand the many different values that uh, green infrastructure implementation can bring to us. Um, but we're going to focus, of course, just on the, on the GIST project and process here. And going to the next slide, you uh, may be able to pick up a, a better sense of the land use of the KK watershed. It's about 25 square miles, entirely urbanized, and picks up land mass from six different municipalities including the city of Milwaukee, but also five other municipalities that um, are within Milwaukee County. Uh, for those who may have, um, from outside the area, outside the, of Wisconsin, uh, you may have flown into and out of our General Mitchell International Airport. You might see at the bottom right-hand corner of the watershed that airport uh, facility there. That is uh, one of the most upper uh, most reach, uh, reaches of the Kinnikinnick River watershed. And uh, from there, water flows off of uh, that facility down through Wilson Park Creek into the Milwaukee main stem and uh, ultimately to the northeast out into the, uh, the inner harbor and then to the outer harbor uh, before getting out into Lake Michigan itself. The watershed challenges that face the KK are not necessarily uncommon to uh, urban watersheds like this, um, but they're pretty severe in the case of the KK. Um, and that's mostly because of, if you look at the, the series of challenges identified on the next slide, Beth, um, they're pretty severe in the case of the KK because most of that 25 square miles has been fully developed for at least 40 years, in many cases much longer than that. And the historic pattern of development and land use that um, you know existed uh, much before the Clean Water Act was a, a glimmer in someone's eye really uh, leads to conditions and characteristics on the ground in the watershed that really cause some significant challenges. And I would imagine that most folks on the webinar have some understanding of what these challenges are um, in the KK, even if you've never been here, because you're aware of watershed-related issues and challenges in other parts of the country. Um, certainly, if there are questions or comments on this, maybe we can come back to it, but I don't want to get too much into the weeds um, with respect to the kind of water resource challenges that um, the, the watershed here faces. But what I would come back to say is, again, um, the ability of our agency, which is the primary health care provider to Milwaukee Southside, our ability to help people become healthy or stay healthy really depends on, on our ability and our partner's ability to provide a healthy environment. And the conditions of the Kinnikinnick River watershed right now just are, are not doing that in many different cases. The next slide shows some images um, that are characteristic of the areas where we've been most active 
along the Kinnikinnick River. These are uh, taken from the uh, downstream most two miles of the river itself, uh, which are some of the, those older neighborhoods, again, because of where it's located, uh, where, the, where, these, the, where the river's located in the metro area. But um, it's not uncommon across the watershed to see homes um, you know, huddled right up to the banks of the river or one of its tributaries like this. Flooding is a major concern. Flood risk is a major concern. Both non-point and point source discharges are concerns. And uh, the overall impact that um, the condition of a channel like this has on a neighborhood and on a community is, is really hard to quantify, but it's pretty easy to feel. So what we know based on our time working in the Kinnikinnick River watershed is that not only are there challenges, there are major opportunities. Um, what we know in order for us to be successful at 16th Street and for our partners to be successful and looking to the next slide is that we need more investment, we need money coming from all directions and from and benefiting a diverse group of stakeholders and we need that kind of investment and activity generating multiple benefits. We need water resource improvements generating neighborhood stabilization benefits. We need crime and safety concerns benefiting or triggering improvements in parks and open space. That, that's how we achieve our ultimate vision of a healthy community on the south side of Milwaukee. And what we've seen over the years is that we've, we've started to see early successes in going to the next slide, there are just uh, some quick images that help to characterize how we've started to engage people around water resource improvements, how stormwater and floodwater management projects and objectives can generate other tangible benefits for, um, for them, their families, their households, and their neighbors. Um, and we're really happy about that. But importantly, we need a lot more of that. Um, going on across the entire watershed. So when we were approached by Climate Interactive and Beth about the exploration of the GIST um, project, it, it was a natural for us to come to the conclusion that, look, we, we need to see how this concept can help us generate greater investment from more stakeholders that might over time generate significant greater value and multiple benefits. So that brings us up to when Beth and I first met. Um, I'm going to hand it over back to Beth, and she's going to talk about what happened from that point on, and I'll come back and share a little bit more at the back end. Great. Thanks, Ben. That's um, was a great introduction. So this slide is just to thank the, um, the many partners who've had a hand in shaping or delivering part of this project, and Ben mentioned many of them. Um, where Climate Interactive comes into the mix is we're a national organization. Um, you can see a lot about us on our website, which is just climateinteractive.org. And our unique niche is that we use computer simulations to help people make the best decisions they can in complex systems. Uh, we're particularly focused on climate change, where it connects to clean energy, food, and water, and resilience. And um, you'll see in a minute that uh, green infrastructure connects to all three of, of those issues, so it was particularly interesting to us. Our approach um, is to uh, mathematically represent the complexity in a system, but that usually is uh, buried deep within the tools that we create, and we work really hard to have an interface which is um, engaging for non-technical experts. And um, in a few slides, I'll show you what that looked like for this particular tool. The, um, the question we came to Milwaukee with, uh, motivated by particularly our funder, the Cerdna Foundation based in New York City, was whether a simulation could be applied to infrastructure decisions like this. And particularly, could it help leverage those three things Ben said were needed? Um, more resources, more understanding of the multiple benefits, and a more diverse stakeholders who were um, proponents of green infrastructure. Uh, the tool we ended up creating over the course of about a year and a half of uh, computer simulation building, we ended up calling the Green Infrastructure Scenarios Tool, as Ben mentioned. Uh, the method that we use, if any of you on the call are um, modelers yourself, is system dynamics computer simulation. And 
the thing that's particularly helpful about it is that it, it allows for what-if scenario testing about different investment choices. So we wanted to create a tool where community members and decision makers could really quickly experiment with allocating a budget to different options to address different concerns in the community and see in uh, very quick succession in a matter of seconds what the what the results would be and we're particularly focused on people talking with each other in the process so this is a typical picture from uh, the stakeholder groups that we convened with Ben and his colleagues in Milwaukee you see there's a laptop on the table that's running the tool um, but you can see people aren't really particularly looking at the tool they're talking with each other and that's really what we're aiming for um, we have um, I guess a theory that we brought to this work which is that um, helping people connect to the multiple benefits of particular types of infrastructure can help that infrastructure go to scale. When it comes to green infrastructure, um, we're focused on its ability to deliver and protect clean water, um, its potential to provide good jobs that can't be outsourced, uh, its impacts on health and well-being, which Ben has talked a lot about, uh, its ability to connect people to their neighborhood and to each other through the landscape that they walk through, uh, its potential to save energy, particularly um, infrastructure like green roofs that uh, reduces the heating and cooling needs of a building um, and trees that provide shade and relief from the urban heat island effect are all important parts of green infrastructure. Um, its ability to help with resilience and their particularly um, stormwater management issues that Ben alluded to in terms of flooding um, and sewer overflows and basement backups. And at the intersection of these, um, particularly out of both the energy savings and the ability of living plants to sequester carbon, we also see long-term benefits for the climate. What we felt um, was that around the country, people were very focused on the stormwater management uh, benefits and some of the water quality benefits, maybe not seeing all of the other intersections. And so our goal with GIST was to help people see the connections. And we ended up focusing on 10 different co-benefits of green infrastructure. Uh, each of these icons, you're actually looking now at a picture of the interface of the tool. Each of these is one of the co-benefits we heard people in Milwaukee telling us really mattered to them. And in a minute, I'll show you um, how, the, how the interface works to test scenarios. But for now, just take it as a list of this, this wide-ranging set of, of different co-benefits from water quality, water uh, stormwater management, urban heat island effect, jobs and property values, green spaces, energy savings. And as we brought groups of people together, one goal that we had was um, to bring people who weren't necessarily in conversation with each other into an understanding of green infrastructure. So we had um, health experts who cared about the air quality benefit and economic development experts who cared about the jobs who wouldn't um, necessarily maybe think that they had much to do with water management. And so that was one exciting thing about this project was the ability to bring people together. Um, I won't say lots about this, but uh, in building any tool at Climate Interactive, we go through an iterative process uh, where we really think the expertise lies in the community. And so our modeling team uh, represented those 25 square miles that Ben was talking about in terms of um, their hydrology and their percent impermeable surface and their behavior. Uh, but we went through many, many rounds, maybe 10 rounds of uh, prototypes of the tool that we would show to people in all different aspects of the community and they really helped us make it better in that process. You can look at this uh, diagram on our, our website if you want to delve into it more. Uh, this is a sort of high-level overview of what's in GIST. So it um, keeps track of the infrastructure itself, both green and gray, and eight different types of green infrastructure. It uh, keeps track of some of the social dynamics, what, um, what level of support is coming from different subsets of the community. And in the simulation, those things together uh, at any point in time, the simulation runs for 10 years into the future, uh, keep uh, generate an investment in green infrastructure and an investment in green, uh, gray infrastructure. 
um, that infrastructure that's represented in the simulation then gets challenged by rainfall um, and people can set up scenarios for more or less severe rainfall and more or less effective green infrastructure and you put those two things together rain hitting the watershed and the infrastructure there to handle it and the model produces all these outputs on the right um, from some of the water management outputs some of the costs so how much does it cost to operate and maintain whatever infrastructure was built the water quality and energy saving benefits and some of the benefits that ordinary people told us they really cared about and that was everything from basement backups to the urban heat island effect to air quality. Um, this is the, the sort of think of it as the top la layer of the simulation so those groups sitting around tables weren't looking at the uh, even at that detailed schematic I just showed you, much less the mathematical equations underneath it, they were looking at this, where each of these uh, buttons is a scenario that the groups would systematically look at one at a time, so they would choose where to invest, um, and that included uh, nowhere, it included investing their budget all in gray infrastructure, all in green, or in different combinations. Um, and then they would, I'll show you in the next slide what some of the outputs they would look, would look at looked like. Um, we were also having them look at the dynamics of support. So uh, in the simulation, if you don't have all the aspects of a community on board with green infrastructure, you don't realize the full potential of it to scale up. And we were representing that in the simulation. Uh, in more detailed rounds in the second and third workshops, people were also looking at the balance of different types of green infrastructure. So this is allocation of funding in millions of dollars. And by moving these sliders, the groups were looking at scenarios with more or less um, green infrastructure of different types. So you could trade in per, uh, permeable pavement for more green roofs or more bioretention instead of uh, cisterns or rain barrels and see how the system responded. Um, the workshops themselves had the tool, but we had two other elements that we thought were really important to the success of what we did. One was, I mentioned already, how, how multi-sectoral the people that we invited to the workshops were, so that we had a bunch of different perspectives and people who cared about each of the co-benefits. Um, the other element that was really important was that at each workshop we brought in um, local experts who were in one way or another involved in building green infrastructure on the ground. Often they were um, stormwater managers for the city or um, uh, public works um, uh, uh, professionals within the city government. Sometimes they were property owners who had had green infrastructure installed. And it was this, we felt this combination of the rigor of the simulation, the diverse conversations, and then the real world experience was um, an important mix in what we did. We set up the workshops um, in in three uh, sort of in a three staged process. The first one um, was watershed wide. The second one was broken up into municipalities. Ben mentioned um, that there are six within the KK. We focused on um, the three that took up the majority of that land area. Uh, so people from the initial workshop then subdivided in the next workshop to be within municipal boundaries and also reached out to invite more people into the um, conversation. And then the final workshop was back again at the watershed-wide perspective. And that was a design we felt worked pretty well. Um, a few examples of what people were seeing in their small groups and what um, that was getting them to think about and talk about. Here's a screenshot of a, of a scenario where the group invested all of their capital um, into gray infrastructure. And each of these icons in the simulation, based on the underlying math of the simulation, moves toward the right the greater the value is. So you see here it's labeled less impact, more impact all the way on the right. So what people were seeing if they invested um, their full amount to, to invest in gray infrastructure. They were seeing improvements, particularly in, in stormwater management and reduced sewer overflows and reduced basement backups. Some of these other icons, you know, a few jobs. So the jobs, um, uh, which is a combination of jobs, both in green and gray infrastructure, moves a little bit compared to a no investment scenario. Then we had the same groups go back and allocate that money instead of to gray infrastructure to green infrastructure. And that's shown here, and you'll notice a couple things. First of all, um, some of the stormwater management benefits are maybe not 
quite as extreme. You, you lost a little bit. But what the groups noticed right away, of course, is all of these other benefits that are things they really want to see in their communities come along as well. And a really common refrain that we heard in the conversations was this was a balanced scenario. And it was something that appealed to people about um, the mix of benefits that was possible. And I think um, across all the groups who looked at these scenarios, this one was probably the, the favorite. Um, and when, you, when we asked people why, what they really had to say was that they really liked the mix of co-benefits um, that, that were realized. Another uh, exercise that we went through with people was to do this, to take their favorite scenario, the all green investment scenario. Um, and say, well, what would happen if a certain sector of our community didn't support that idea? Um, and if I, if I toggle back and forth, this is um, all green when there's full support from everyone in the community. Here's the all green scenario when residents are not as on board. So what that means in the underlying math of the simulation is the types of green infrastructure that would be on residential properties, which might be things particularly like rain gardens um, or bioretention that might be in a neighborhood would be harder to site, harder to build, and so you wouldn't get the full impact. Um, and that launched the stakeholders into really rich conversations about uh, who needs to be involved and educated and invited into um, the journey of green infrastructure if we're going to succeed here. And I think there was um, a pretty effective awareness built of the fact that you, that you can't really leave any one sector of the community out of these conversations. You need private property owners, you need businesses, you need the city officials um, all to be working together. I also mentioned that we gave people the ability to uh, allocate funds within different types of green infrastructure. And there, um, what they really started to learn was that n uh, not all types of green infrastructure bring the same co-benefits. So we're trying to build people's intuitions. Um, for instance, if, um, if they were to reduce green roofs and put more money into porous pavement, um, they might see improved, uh, slightly improved stormwater management, but lose some of the urban heat island benefits and some of the energy saving benefits. Um, we weren't trying to tell people what the right mix for this watershed was, but we wanted them to start talking with each other about which co-benefits they cared about the most and really wanted to capture. Um, so that's a very fast paced run through what we did, and I'm gonna turn it back over to Ben to talk about uh, what we saw as a result. Yeah, thanks, Beth. So uh, one, one of the many things that we appreciated about how Climate Interactive approached this work in Milwaukee is that not only were they very thoughtful um, and, and pragmatic about everything that Beth just went through uh, in terms of the development of the GIST tool and the curriculum for the workshops and whatnot, but they really saw value in uh, in evaluating in a thoughtful way each step of the way. So we were um, able to grab um, evaluations from each of our participants at those three different stages of the curriculum, um, which really helped us better understand how, how well we were doing in terms of a, a working towards achieving our goals. Um, so the next couple of slides, there's, uh, I'll go through really quickly. Um, that there, there wasn't a, a, a very robust statistical analysis performed on those evaluations that we received, but, but there was really high participation among them. It was really surprising to see how much time people were willing to spend after a three or three and a half hour workshop um, to, to complete evaluation forms. Um, usually you see people burning out of rooms as quickly as possible. but. Um, but we, we really did document that people came out of these workshops with a much better understanding of the whole system. And for some folks, um, you know, the system to them were the pipes that they were responsible for managing because their municipality, their Department of Public Works or the agency that they worked for put them in 20 years ago, had to ensure that they would continue to function for a number of years into the future, and, um, you know, that was the system for them. Um, so framing the co-benefits um, and the system as the watershed and really being able to provide the details for how that system was defined 
in the model, I think, really opened the eyes of a number of our participants. Um, we also, on the next slide, uh, just another image of uh, one of our typical workshops. Um, we really did see that new connections were being made across the watershed. So the participants from the three different municipalities certainly work together in different ways, not, not always in, in deep ways, but um, they certainly are operating under the same regulatory framework, so they're interacting with one another and with the same types of regulators overseeing their work, but, um, but they don't necessarily interact around green infrastructure in a direct way. And we provided them a new opportunity to talk about green infrastructure and again, that whole system's view of that watershed, not municipality by municipality, but as a group of stakeholders that were working together from the perspective of watershed management. And, um, you know, it, it's still surprising to, to see how um, in some cases it, it's really difficult to achieve that, um, even though the, you know, the concepts of watershed management have been around now for, for a number of decades. Um, looking at um, the, the landscape of opportunity, as we've defined it on the next slide, um, getting people who are used to seeing, an op seeing their community look and function a certain way um, and used to making decisions in the same way about opportunities. Uh, and providing them a different way of thinking short term about opportunities for green infrastructure implementation that might be right in front of them or opportunities for green infrastructure that might be a number of years out um, and to think about how to start incorporating um, the, the integration or integrating green infrastructure concepts into those projects that might be five years out was something that we also saw happening um, particularly in those three workshops that were targeting the, the municipalities specifically. And um, it, it really did afford them a, a different way to think about projects, not just the one that lands on their desk and, uh, you know, they're charged with dealing with, with that particular project, but, um, but thinking more open, uh, in a more open-minded way about, about what their community is going to look like and how it's going to function in five or ten years out. And then, uh, finally, and I, I think, you know, Beth certainly covered this in her earlier comments, simply understanding and, and helping people understand how different decisions now have different impacts on various co-benefits over the course of time um, was another major outcome of the project. So um, next steps for us uh, from the completion of the, the GIST workshop series, which wrapped up back in July, are summarized on the next couple of slides. and. Um, without going into too much detail, and I want to be able to hand the, the baton off to the, uh, the Tennessee group as well, um, we really are hopeful um, and uh, have high expectations that the GIST process and project that we've summarized here on the webinar really is going to help us accelerate and expand the application of green infrastructure in the KK watershed, along with other initiatives in, in part that I mentioned earlier but that the, the use of the, the co-benefit terminology and, um, and more specifically those various co-benefits that aren't always closely associated with green infrastructure are really going to help us bring in more investment from that more diverse stakeholder group. And um, as we set out at the early stages of our project, we, we knew that one of the things uh, we wanted to do at the highest level was simply build a stronger voice for green infrastructure application throughout the watershed. And I think that our process has certainly helped us build a stronger voice for green infrastructure that is, uh, you know, strengthening that call for additional investment. And finally, we have more practical or, um, you know, applied elements in terms of how the GIST is influencing ongoing decisions about watershed management. We've got a watershed advisory committee that's helping to make some important generational decisions about the Kinnikinnick River watershed, particularly focused on flow management issues and flood risk issues across the watershed, but we're also incorporating water quality concerns more and more into the dialogue around quantity control. 
we're looking to downscale and we'll be taking steps to downscale a regional green infrastructure plan that was developed uh, and finalized a couple of years ago to focus just on the KK. And I think the co-benefits specifically are going to be incorporated as one of the ways that we can evaluate recommendations and help prioritize recommendations in that watershed green infrastructure plan that will be developed over the course of the next 12 to 18 months. And then just simply because of the stakeholders that we've engaged through this process, we have uh, built momentum around both neighborhood scale and property specific approaches to green infrastructure that we're hoping to to continue to drive forward and to see ultimately more green infrastructure being implemented, uh, more so as a, a direct result of participation through our workshop series. And uh, I think that brings us to the end of our slides on the green infrastructure scenarios tool.